Okay, well, thank you, Carrie and Jennifer, for inviting me here. So I'm excited to actually talk a bit about this. So most of the talks that I give are usually research and science, and I was actually quite thrilled to be able to come and talk a little bit about one of my passions, and that is education. So uh, as Carrie said, I've been teaching for at the medical school now for first-year medical students probably over 20 years, and it's something that I really do enjoy um, and spend a lot of time on, uh, as Meredith knows. I'm just going to see if I can get this to present now. Okay. And so, uh, in one of the areas that I do research in is pain. And, uh, of course, I teach a bit about pain, but I teach about the whole nervous system in general for the medical students. And one of the first things that I often tell medical students in year one is that one of the reasons that patients actually come to seek physicians and healthcare is because of pain. And so, besides maybe your regular checkups, you really go to see, or patients come to see doctors because they begin to have some type of pain. And yet, the question of how much pain is taught in our medical schools is really just uh, tiny compared to some of the other topics. And so I thought I'd start uh, this lecture by talking a little bit about uh, the discussion of how much pain is in our medical schools before I go into some of the sex differences. And so this was an article that was put out a little bit ago in the Journal of Pain. It was a, a fantastic article in which it, it looked at the pain education in our medical schools in North American medical schools. And this included Canada, although most of the schools were in the U.S. And so it was 117 schools, medical schools in the United States. Or I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, a total of 117 with 104 in the U.S. and 13 schools from Canada. And they actually even had some inclusion criteria of which schools to include uh, and when they looked through all the curricula to see how much pain was actually being taught in the medical schools. And so 28 schools actually were excluded, and so out of that there was 117 schools being used. And so this was looking at some of the data in the amount of time that's spent in four years of medical school, how much time is spent on pain itself. And so you'll see that the, the U.S. medical schools are in the darker ones here. And this is looking at hours, so four years of medical school, and this is the approximate hours that's actually devoted to the teachings of pain in general. So zero to five hours or five to ten hours, as compared to the Canadian schools in which there's somewhere between 15 to 20 hours and more even greater than 30 hours being spent on pain education. Now, I also say this in the fact that as most of you know, there's an opiate epidemic that's going on, and of course this includes the use of uh, analgesics, including narcotics, uh, and so they included that as far as the uh, development of talking about pain as well as pain medications. When you looked at the actual survey, and they looked at a number of different topics or major topics that are being taught in the medical schools, and of course they're looking at either the topics themselves, or I've circled actually over here the uh, number of hours that are actually being uh, used, and I don't know if I should use the mouse on here, but the, the slide is not actually on my computer, so I have to actually go. Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and what you can look, what you see right away is the clinical assessment, it's about 1.4 hours that are being devoted throughout four years of medical school to pain. Canadian school is about three hours. The basic science, you can see very little basic science actually being presented about pain. Uh, sex differences being even less that I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, but they went through different topics, and I also uh, circled this one here, the pharmacological management, meaning opiates, narcotics, NSAIDs, uh, antidepressants that are talked about. 0.7 hours in the U.S. schools throughout the four years, uh, Canadian only one hour. And so you can actually go through the multiple different topics where it's looking at other things, whether it's uh, cancer types of pain, acute pain, oncology, uh, oncological pain, or even human and social costs of pain. Look at this, only 0.4 hours in four years of medical school being devoted to that time uh, in our U.S. medical schools. And so when you looked at the conclusions of the studies, basically approximately 80% of the U.S. schools do actually require at least one or more pain sessions. And so it is required for most of the medical schools, whereas the Canadian school is about 92% of the time devoted towards it. And if you look at the median hours that are devoted to our Canadian schools or have at least twice as much as the U.S. schools in teaching about pain. Nine teaching hours for U.S., 19 and a half hours for the Canadian schools. And so, of course, this is like less than 0.3 percent or about 0.3 percent of the total time within the four years of the medical school curriculum. 
and they concluded within this particular study that the amount of education on pain in general, and it's even less, I'll tell you, for sex differences, uh, was limited, variable, and very fragmented throughout the four years of medical school. There needs to be new ways to approach it, and I found this very uh, kind of an exciting thing towards the end of the conclusion of this paper, and they said that the students in vet schools spend five times more studying pain and how to take care of pain for animals than we spend in medical schools talking about pain for patients. Well, I, when this was a, at least a person who's, who does research in pain, I thought this was interesting and I wanted to know if the European schools were very similar and I can tell you that they were. And so there was a recent study that was done in the European schools, this was done in about 2015 or so, uh, in which uh, they looked at a number of different European schools uh, medical schools, 90% of all the medical schools in 15 European countries, and the median number of hours spent teaching pain there was about 12 hours, so it's a little bit between U.S. and the Canadian schools. And so you can kind of get the breakdown which France actually teaches the most, the blue bars being sort of what they would call require module, required modules of pain, uh, with the white being electives. You can look at the U.K., and it's actually about 11 hours, so a little bit more than the U.S., but really um, very many, many, most of the schools don't teach a lot about pain. And so, uh, and of course the, the ways that they actually do teaching methods over in Europe as well as assessment is very similar to the United States and the fact that of course it's classroom lectures with some practical base, placement based and so on and so forth. And of course many of the schools now in the U.S. are changing their curriculum and how they teach pain as well as assessment. And so the conclusion, of course, of that study in Europe was that there needs to be more time spent on pain education. One of the reasons why we don't spend a lot of time on pain education really comes down to the dollars. Uh, when we look at NIH budget, as far as how much money is put towards uh, pain scientists and pain education, it's minimal compared to things like cancer. And so I thought I would bring a little bit of statistics here. This is 2012. NIH spent about $5.6 billion in cancer research. Whereas in pain, it was about 396 million. So it's a 15-fold greater amount being spent on cancer, which I still think is a very important topic. However, chronic pain affects over 100 million Americans, uh, and this is just in the US, whereas cancer affects about 13.7 million. And so there's a huge number of people that suffer from chronic pain. Uh, as most of you know, we just don't have good medications for that, and so I brought a little bit of statistics on sex differences uh, in, in narcotics as well. Um, but we don't have good medications even for chronic pain. So when we start to look now at the sex differences in pain, uh, this is the actual NIH budget that's devoted to pain, and you can see most of it's all about pain mechanisms at the top here with 20 or percent or so uh, devoted towards pain, whereas sex differences uh, down at 1.1 percent of that budget is going towards sex differences and pain. And so there's very little that's going on. So. <clears throat> Roger Fulman, who's a MD who does a lot of study in clinical pain uh, at Florida, uh, put together a very uh, excellent publication trying to look at sex differences in pain. Uh, and so what he's noticed within the last really 10 years or so is that the number of publications have really increased. And so this is good news in the fact that people are beginning to be aware that there are sex differences in pain. Um, I'm sure if I ask you all uh, what type of differences might you expect as far as pain and sex differences, the first thing that usually comes to mind is headache, in which headache is often more experienced in uh, females than males, and I'll show you some differences between that, but uh, finally there are start, starting to see studies in which there are looking at uh, publications with sex differences in clinical pain, and of course this is now being followed up, as Virginia pointed out, with animal studies with the requirement by NIH. This coming out of that study starts to look at the prevalence of chronic pain and it was nice in the fact that they did break it down between females and males and so uh, in a number of different countries and so we have the United States here with 20 percent uh, chronic pain being suffered more by females as compared to about 18 percent males uh, and you can see this trend across many different countries and so it's well known now that chronic pain may actually be suffered more by females than males, but of course this also comes down to the idea of how you report pain. Um, again, the way that pain's reported is usually based off some kind of scale, zero to ten, zero no pain, ten the worst pain ever, uh, and believe it or not, it's sort of a psychological test in the fact of who will report having more pain, males or females, and so it's a, it's a great question that of course people in the pain field uh, often, uh, often worry about 
how it's reported. And of course, often that can be the idea that males won't report pain as much as females. Now, this kind of got messed up here. <laughs> so this, uh, this was actually looking at pain syndromes and some divisions between fail and, uh, female and male ratio uh, between the different types of pain. And I've listed them here, but now this has come to an absolute mess on this thing. Um, but anyway, so the uh, fibromyalgia is one that's more often reported in females than males. Uh, six to one ratio as far as female to male. Irritable bowel syndrome, again, more often in female than male, two to one ratio. Uh, interstitial cystitis or painful bladder, nine times more prevalent in females than males. Migraine, as I said, and, and headache in general, but definitely migraine for sure, three to four times more likely in females than males. Uh, and headaches and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we also have a number of different categories in which females suffer from that uh, are female-specific uh, types of pain, whether it's chronic pelvic pain, uh, vulvodynia, or a number of different other types of actual pain that's suffered only by females. And so the categories of chronic pain tend to be much higher in females than males. Again, many of these studies also showed that the comorbidity, which is like right on top of the sucker, <laughs> It tend to be higher in things like stress, anxiety, and uh, or, or, uh, depression, in which chronic pain can lead depression, and we know that it often does. So one of the things that I do in the lab is uh, look at sex differences as far as migraine or headache. And again, most of the studies that I have done is looking at animals and trying to understand, uh, is this something that's driven by, let's say, estrogen or uh, differences as far as estrogen receptors? And so uh, the Migraine is a very interesting type of chronic pain in the fact that many, many people suffer from either migraine or headache. Uh, and it's unique in the fact that there's no pathology. So if you think about a headache, it comes on, and especially migraine, it can be devastating. Uh, it results in a huge loss as far as work productivity. And nobody knows exactly what's happening or what causes migraines or headaches. There's no real pathology. It comes on, it's there for a while, it's extremely painful, and then eventually things resolve as far as a headache and nobody can figure out what's causing the headache, why the headache's there, has there been any changes, so on and so forth. And three of, out of four migrant sufferers typically are uh, female. And so this was, uh, again, out of that study with Roger where he also asked the question about migraine headache. And again, you can look at the prevalence of migraine headache across a number of different countries, including the U.S. And again, you'll see more likely occurring in females than males. And so at least for educational purpose, uh, it's something that should be taught in medical schools that there are chronic pains that uh, females suffer from more than uh, males. And understanding that is another problem. The, they're also doing imaging now. Uh, this is an interesting study, I thought, and it's only the beginning of several new in, uh, imaging studies that I'll also uh, uh, share with you. And the fact of trying to figure out, is the human brain between females and males different when they suffer from things like headache or other types of chronic pain. And so this was one of the first studies, and I think there's uh, better studies that are coming along. But again, it was in clinical pain. They're looking at cluster headaches, and they're looking between females and males. And this was actually two different studies. So there's the Ross and Fishman study versus the uh, Bahara study. And they didn't show that there really was a difference between whether the headaches were on the left side or the right side. Uh, typically, they are unilateral. Uh, there's very little bilateral activity. But what they did show was some statistics or statistical differences between males and females as far as where the pain would show up. And so often, even though uh, it's usually typically around the eye, we call periorbital or just behind the eye, it tends to be higher in males around the periorbital area and for females more towards the mandibular joint. Uh, so in areas of the cheek or the jaw tend to have uh, areas of higher amounts of pain. They went on to look at age and onset. So as Virginia said, it's nice to actually parcel these things out between male and female as well as age. And so they saw that uh, the females uh, at younger ages have more cluster headaches. Now, they did this with cluster headache versus migraine. Uh, but they showed that younger females had more cluster headaches than males. But then it kind of reversed, at least in this particular study, in which males at the age of 20 to 30 had more cluster headaches than females and then sort of balanced out after that. They also looked at the different types of associated symptoms because we know that in headaches uh, there are different things that come on and they found that in females you tend to have more nausea and phonophobia, meaning that they don't like the loud noises, whereas in male they tend to have more rhinorrhea and lacrimation, 
uh, again, with no real great significant difference uh, between those different ones. So, uh, again, different types of symptoms that can occur. What they did find significance was uh, the triggers, and I found this very interesting to look at, again, with uh, what causes their headaches. And you'll see for males, the first three are all alcohol uh, related. So, beer, red wine, and hard liquor uh, causing more of the trigger for the actual headache. Whereas in females, you'll see it sort of uh, comes to the area of weather changes, smells, and bright lights, uh, listen, uh, flashing lights, or even TV. And so, uh, again, uh, I love these types of studies where they are starting to look at not only differences in ages and migraines and triggers, but uh, what's actually causing these things. And finally, they've also looked at uh, comorbidities or other types of things that might uh, happen with uh, males and females uh, uh, that suffer from cluster headaches. Uh, and right away, you can see some differences. So uh, here are females, again, suffering more also with asthma, restless leg, whereas, and uh, a little bit more depression with females and cluster headaches, whereas in males, you'll see with sleep apnea. And so uh, whether one's a cause or another, that's uh, hard to say there. Some of our own studies looking at, again, migraine. This is an actual animal study. So we started to, to ask the question, are there differences between males and females? Uh, you might ask, well, how in the heck do we ever measure pain in an animal uh, that's having a migraine or a headache? Uh, we have different ways to actually induce headaches or migraines. Uh, we can give KCL or inflammatory factors directly onto the meninges. Uh, and believe it or not, the animal will have multiple things that will occur. First, it'll be a cortical spreading depression, which is very similar to an aura. So if anybody in the audience here has had migraines, you know what an aura is that typically comes on prior to your migraine. Uh, and you can actually record that, uh, just as we do with an, like an EEG in a human, we do the same with a rat, and you can see that. Uh, but they also have what's very common uh, in uh, humans as well, is they have what we call sensitivity around the face, especially around the eye and the jaw area. So they have sort of this periorbital types of sensitivity, and you can measure that. And so we've done that, and we've actually showed a very clear difference between females and males, showing that females tend to have more of this actual pain than uh, males. Uh, again, their thresholds are decreased, meaning that they're very sensitive to simple touch uh, into the periorbital face. And what I find interesting is that the makeup of the blood-brain barrier is changing. Now, this is an area that's very open for uh, research, and it's my only research slide. So, <laughs> but, uh, but there's big differences that we're seeing with the opening and closing of the blood-brain barrier during stages of chronic pain. And it differs between males and females. Uh, so this is actually showing over time between males and females, and this is actually looking at a particular transporter that plays a role in things like drugs, actually, or medications crossing the blood-brain barrier. And you can see that there's a significant decrease or drop-off of this transporter in females, but not in males, suggesting that medications may actually differ in how they're going to be effective in something like headache uh, in males and females. So going back to the clinical trial studies, I wanted to bring a little bit of data about sex differences in post-operative pain. Um, you'll often hear, okay, so maybe women suffer more from chronic pain than, than uh, our females suffer more from chronic pain than males, as I showed you in the previous slides. But what about things like just post-operative surgery, just after surgery? And so you can see there are a number of different clinical trials or clinical studies that have been done. Again, there's, different, uh, there's difference between females and males, and so that's the numbers here. And I circled some of the ones with larger numbers of uh, patients. So here, uh, looking at, uh, let's just say this knee uh, replacement, 4,000 females in this study, 2,900 in males. Uh, and you can see, this is looking at a, a pain rating scale, that females tend to report more pain than males. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this may be something in the fact that females are more likely to report that there's pain than males. For some reason, there's a psychological uh, barrier with men trying to report that they actually may have chronic pain. Uh, maybe it also depends on who's asking them uh, who has that pain. But you'll see often in many of the studies where females will report more pain than males, although there are large studies here. This is outpatient surgery in which it was pretty much equal, uh, and it was a little bit different between days, but more or less equal. So the question is, is, is you know, are females actually having more pain after uh, acute surgeries or not? Uh, I think the data is still left to be to understand how people are reporting their pain. Um, as mentioned uh, by Virginia in the first talk, uh, do medications differ? Well, this is a whole other bag uh, in trying to figure out 
do medications affect males versus females differently? Of course we know that there are different regulations of enzymes that metabolize things like morphine. I wanted to bring data for opiates and narcotics, again, based on this narcotic epidemic that we're facing now. And so this is looking at medications, again, a number of different clinical trial studies, looking at different types of pain and the use in most of these studies here in morphine. Uh, and what I can get out of the data is that most often it's almost equal. So you'll see some studies where males needed more morphine than females. You'll also see some studies in which females made it, needed more than males. But again, it's very, very mixed. Um, so far, there's no clear uh, answer to say that uh, one uh, sex needs uh, something like morphine more than others to actually uh, relieve their pain. And again, this is a, I guess some of these slides get jumbled up, but basically this says the same thing through using morphine. Unfortunately, somewhere down here it also talks about heroin. I wanted to go into a little bit about addiction. Uh, again, the, the theory out there is that there may be sex differences as far as addiction. I can tell you in adults there tends to be a higher uh, need or dose uh, in males uh, in heroin addicts than females. Uh, but what's very interesting, and, and this is new data that just came out with adolescents in using narcotics and heroin in which females were requiring more uh, than males. And again, I think those are just, uh, that was only one study so far done with that, but uh, I think there, we will have, a, we will have uh, many more studies coming along to determine whether uh, opiates are needed more for pain between male and females and then uh, addiction. And so, what are the, some of the differences? Uh, well, I think uh, there are a number of studies that have tried to determine whether things like estrogen or androgens may actually change the needs for opiates. And so I found this actually study uh, quite interesting. This is uh, by Lee and Ho, and we're trying to look at molecular mechanisms of differences, sex differences, uh, and for the need of opiates. Uh, and of course, we know that there are at least three different types of receptors for things like estrogen. We have the nuclear receptors as well as the G-protein coupled receptor. And what they found uh, is, and their own studies as well as some other studies in the literature showed that estrogen may actually cause the opiate receptors, and here we have two different opiate receptors, the mu, which is what most of our analgesics work at, uh, but we have a, this, this family of kappa agonists coming along. I don't know if most of you know about buprenorphine, but there's a number of kappa agonists coming along. Uh, kappa agonists tend to uh, reduce the amount of addictive uh, properties, and that's why we're seeing so many of them now being pushed. But what they showed was that estrogen would actually cause these receptors to dimerize and to come together and may actually alter the opiate analgesic effect, suggesting that maybe if you have this, this, uh, these two receptors dimerize, you get sort of the euphoria effect, the addiction effect on this side, whereas kappa will actually produce dysphoria. If you use a pure kappa agonist, it'll actually produce very terrible feelings like people do never take them again. And, Merck unfortunately found that out when they gave kappa agonist, uh, selective kappa agonist to humans and they would never take the second dose if it was by itself because there was all kinds of hallucinations and crazy dysphoria. However, when they combine the two, they found that it starts to reduce the addictive properties of the mu agonist. And again, this may be driven by the, uh, some of the estrogen uh, and estrogen receptors. They went on in the paper, and I won't go through all the molecular mechanisms, but basically they went through the paper to say that the nuclear ones can change the number of receptors, of opiate receptors, and the G proteins may be modulating the effects of the opiate receptors, because of course the opiate receptors are G protein coupled receptors, and in the end they modulate ion channels. And so the take home message here is that this is still at the beginning of trying to understand how estrogens and or androgens may modulate estrogen uh, and uh, I'm sorry, how, yeah, androgens and estrogen may modulate opiate receptors. Uh, again, as I said, there are different ones looking at drug abuse as well, preclinical and clinical studies. A um, number of these studies, and so I've just pulled two of them, uh, but there are a number of ones coming out now showing that maybe females appear to be more vulnerable uh, than males to reinforcing effects of opiates and addiction. And again, this was an animal study, but there are some preclinical and clinical studies that indicate that Again, ovarian hormones such as estrogen may uh, play some role in producing sex differences in drug abuse. And I think we just have to hold on to figure out whether the, this will come out and pan out statistically. Uh, another paper that was uh, printed as a review, Sex and Estrogen Influences on Drug Abuse. And again, the conclusions here were that females tend to be more sensitive to rewarding drugs uh, than males. And so this was, a, this was a recent paper as I was preparing for this. This just came out in April here of 2017, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Sex differences in the fear of pain. 
you know, are there differences? Uh, and I can say yes, uh, once this study actually came out. And so this looked at 185 healthy college students. Uh, and what they did, well, they had 49.7% females, 50.3% males in the study. They used a uh, different uh, measures of pain-related questionnaire type things. So there's 30 items on their questionnaire. And what they found was that there are sex differences in, the, in what the people fear or have severe fear of pain. Again, with females expressing this more than males. And so they weren't sure if it's because females are being more honest. Uh, again, this goes back to uh, often when you're doing their pain rating scales between males and females, where females will report more pain than males. Uh, they also uh, express some explanations for their sex differences and that there might be psychosocial mechanisms of fear and anxiety of pain that are being more expressed in females than males, and that they, females actually reacted more into the interpretation of the actual questions on the survey than males did. And so again, I thought this was a, an interesting study that was uh, just done. Are there differences in the neuroimmunity and, and in immunological responses in pain? And the answer is yes. If you're interested in sex, uh, based differences in general with the nervous system, I highly recommend this journal. It's completely devoted to it. Uh, I'm going to reference a number of uh, one or two articles out of this particular journal, but this is a fantastic journal if you're looking at sex differences in the neurosciences. Um, this is a one that was done by Jeff Mogul, probably one of the leaders as far as looking at sex differences in pain. And uh, he reports the fact that women do suffer from chronic pain, as I reported higher, so there's higher rates than men and that they may actually be due to the immune system. And so I find this very interesting in the fact that there's big differences uh, in the immune response in pain, with uh, women having more of a pro-inflammatory and men having more of an anti-inflammatory system. And so he shows that in the review here as well as his own studies. Um, he's looking at some differences here between females and males. This was a different study. Uh, showing how you could induce the actual factors. And so here you'll see that the percent maximum of allodynia was increased by male, but you had to really try to induce it through a particular immune system pathway. Uh, but what he concludes is this wonderful figure out of that paper that I was just uh, sh talking about in the Journal of Neuroscience, in which he claims that estrogen may be stimulating more of the macrophages and more of what we call sort of this uh, pro-inflammatory pathway whereas the androgens may be actually activating more of the anti-inflammatory pathways, the IL-10s. And so they find this that goes on both systemically as well as in the CNS, and that this may be some of the reasons that drive more chronic pain uh, in females, because it's the inflammatory factors that, are, of course, go up during acute pain, but they may actually convert acute pain to chronic pain, uh, driving it towards that. The study, that, again, showing that there's differences as far as the immune cells that are, or the immune factors that are being expressed, whether it's different cytokines. Uh, this was interesting that the, in the female studies there was an increase in one of the main pain neurotransmitters, CGRP. Uh, I'm not sure if you've talked a lot about that as far as with the medical students, but this is going to be a big one coming up with headache. So just about every big pharmaceutical company now has made an anti-CGRP that's just about ready to hit the market for headache. It's one of the first ones that actually have become successful in blocking migraine and headache. And of course, there's, uh, it's not a surprise that it's actually higher in females than males. And so, uh, again, there's been a number of studies that have been uh, showing that there are differences in neuroimmune cells uh, that might actually explain some of the uh, more chronic pain that's being expressed in females than males. And so you'll see that uh, most often females are expressing certain types of cytokines and chemokines or activating certain types of T cells. Uh, that are producing more inflammatory types of pain. And so the conclusion of this particular study is that there's ample evidence for a role of the immune system in modulating the transition to and maintenance of chronic pain. And so uh, I think that we're going to see more and more studies looking at the immune system and chronic pain. There is good support that the sex hormones are shifting the activity of the immune system in which women with higher estrogen levels and low testosterone levels are predispositioned for greater pro-inflammatory factors and that men with higher testosterone tend to push things towards the anti-inflammatory pathway. We then started in, in, within that same journal, that journal neuroscience, you'll start to see that there's imaging. Now imaging is really difficult, of course, because, uh, and I could show you all kinds of different uh, fMRI things, but it's hard to actually then pick out 
are there different areas in the brains between males and females that are being activated in chronic pain? Um, but I think as methods get better as far as detailing uh, the, the different areas and, and getting more to statistically uh, saying, yes, it's this particular nuclei that's activated more in females and males. But I, I love the fact that they're doing these studies, they're looking at sex differences, and right away you start to see some of those differences in ones that are more often reported in females than males and things like IBS and headache. And so I think we're still far out from trying to determine the exact areas uh, and of course they start putting these cluster maps together in which there's things that are common in fe uh, females versus males like fibromyalgia, IBS, and migraine trying to determine what areas of the brain are activated in uh, females versus males and uh, are there ways to better treat than chronic pain. Uh, this is a, an actual study that uh, started to look at that and I find it interesting, I won't go through all the details, but if you look at visceral pain and, and the methods here now are fMRI, PET scanning, uh, but what you see right away is that more often an area like the insula of the brain, now this is an area that's deep within the cortex, very responsible, we think of it as our gut brain, so it's the gustatory cortex, but it's also right where pain tends to go. And it tends to be more lit up, as they'll say, or more activated in males versus females. Whereas in that same study they showed that female had more deactivation of the amygdala the area that we think of as more emotion within the brain. And it was more of a deactivation of that area as compared to males. And so, again, th these are sort of new studies that are coming out with trying to determine are there sex differences within the brain in patients who suffer from uh, chronic pain, whether it's visceral pain or other types of pain. And I, I find these uh, studies fascinating and something I think that we'll be sharing with our med students in the next five to ten years. Uh, as I said, this journal has a number of different ex excellent papers in there, so this is understanding the broad influence of sex hormones and sex differences in the brain, and so I'm going to finish with just a, a little bit out of this paper. I find it interesting, they've actually gone through a number of different categories, including pain, but let me just show you one image that I find that, uh, again, we're, we're just at the very tip of understanding the sex differences in, in activity in the brain, but I love this figure. I don't know if you've used this with your med students or not, but this is demonstrating uh, taking a nice pyramidal cell right out of the hippocampus and we think that it occurs of course in learning and memory which I know now that this is also a, plays a big role in pain and understanding what causes pain. Uh, but they put on estrogen and so this is naive without estrogen and you can see one of the dendrites with all the spines. You put on estrogen and they say basically within the 24 hours, look at this sucker. It's like a tree that just grew with all its branches during the springtime. So you see all kinds of uh, synapses or, um, or a budding of different uh, uh, what they call spines onto the actual dendrite and then you continue to wait 72 hours or later and you can see that it goes back to normal suggesting that estrogen is really causing a significant change within that dendritic tree and again supporting the idea and this didn't of course uh, uh, did not occur with uh, androgens they have a actual conclusion within that particular paper looking at the differences between estrogen receptors whether it's nuclear membrane versus the androgen receptors and it's a fantastic study in the idea that estrogen receptors are on different types of neurons. And so they're, they're concluding that the nuclear estrogen receptors are loaded on GABAergic neurons, which we know are all over within the brain, whereas the androgen receptors are not. The androgen receptors, which tend to be more of a nuclear receptor on the pyramidal cell itself within the hippocampus, whereas the uh, different types of membrane receptors for estrogen uh, are out here on the dendritic trees and they're also col uh, controlling acetylcholine's input into that hippocampus. And so, again, I think we're just at the beginning of understanding sex differences and the receptors that are located in the central nervous system that play a different role in things like learning and memory or chronic pain. And so, in summary, I think that our medical schools really lack uh, understanding and, and, and hours of teachings as far as in the areas of chronic pain and analgesics. Uh, I think that's uh, very obvious now when you ask fourth year med students. Uh, I often do this and I even teach in, the, uh, in CME as well as in all the resident programs as far as analgesics and I always feel like at least a first year resident should know how morphine works and I'm always just shocked at uh, the fact that these are doctors that are in the process of prescribing these things but have no clue uh, in how these medications work or how pain works and so I think there's a big need as Virginia pointed out, that we continue the education in year one all the way through residency and into fellowship. Pain research, uh, 
especially in sex differences, are really completely underfunded and one of the reasons why we have uh, probably less people teaching about pain. There are differences between males and females. There's no doubt. I've showed you some evidence for that. There are differences between males and females as far as the analgesic efficacy, possibly. Um, there's still uh, lots to be said about here and whether it's analgesic efficacy and or addiction probabilities, although we'll know in the future here. There, there may be sex differences as far as the fear of pain as well as the comorbidities that occur with pain. Sex differences in the neural immune system, and I find this one very exciting in the fact that there are differences uh, and a number of people have been looking at changes in the immune system with sex differences that then relate to uh, things becoming chronic pain and maybe why we have more females suffering from chronic pain than males. There are sex differences in the areas of the CNS that produce the pain and then finally there are differences as far as the estrogen androgen receptors being located on neurons and may play a role in that. There are a number of different other uh, things that of course can come up for discussion because I think understanding the challenges in, in researching sex differences apply to not only pain but in the nervous system as well as many of the different fields that uh, you guys are all familiar with so I won't go through all those. Uh, but there are a number of different challenges. And so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and we'll answer any questions.